The African baobab is one of the largest living things in the world, an icon of the African landscape, instantly recognizable, mysterious, and intriguing. It's a deciduous tree that only occurs at low altitudes in hot, dry bushveld. There are six different species, but only one is found in Africa. Baobabs usually occur in thorn woodland on the African savanna where it is dry for at least half the year. They also occur in arid or semi-arid, sometimes rocky areas, as isolated individual trees or groups of trees, in a wide variety of soil types. They don't thrive in waterlogged conditions, preferring well-drained soils. The baobab is widespread in Africa, occurring in 24 countries. It grows between the latitudes 16 degrees north and 26 degrees south, where it often towers above the surrounding vegetation. An imposing presence that comes in many different shapes and sizes. However, it doesn't grow in the equatorial belt across the middle of the continent, where it is too wet. They can't compete with fast-growing leafy plants in high rainfall areas. The young trees can't tolerate freezing temperatures where frost occurs. Somehow, they do flourish in areas with very different rainfall averages, from under 200 mm to over 1,000 mm a year. They are rarely found at altitudes over 1,500 meters. The earliest known mention of the African baobab tree and its fruit is in the 11th century Book of Roads and Kingdoms by Spanish Muslim geographer al bakri The origin of the name baobab is thought to have come from Egypt. In the 16th century, Cairo merchants traded the buhobab fruit in the markets along with herbs and spices. The name refers to its many seeds. Arab traders carried baobab fruit on their voyages, a vitamin-rich food that prevented scurvy. In 1592, Prospero Alpini, the Italian physician and botanist from Venice, wrote the first published description of the baobab. Alpini published drawings of the baobab in his book on exotic plants. The tree is named after French explorer and naturalist Michel Adanson who first wrote a botanical report on them in 1749. The baobab's scientific name became Adansonia digitata. Digitata reflects the configuration of its five finger-like leaves. Charles Darwin documented baobab trees on St. Diego in the Cape Verde Islands in 1832, commenting on their size and longevity. But no fossil evidence survives to point to the real origins of the baobab. In spite of being described as grotesque by early travelers, people have an affection for baobabs. Because of their apparent permanence, notable trees that occur on well-known routes became landmarks for generations of travelers. This tree in Zimbabwe's Save Conservancy is the largest recorded tree in the country with a circumference of 27 meters.
This is Lekhubu Island in Botswana's Magadi Gadi region. It is a granite outcrop just one kilometer long and less than 20 meters high. It is surrounded by salt pans that extend to the horizon. Some 40,000 years ago, this was a vast inland sea. In spite of there being very little soil, hundreds of baobab trees grow on this tiny island. Somehow, the trees have forced their roots down between the rocks to draw enough nourishment to survive. The growth of some of the trees has been stunted. Others have unusual shapes. Well, a few have grown to be as big as any growing in good soils. It is a harsh place with an eerie beauty where the wind often howls across the salt, whipping up the sand. Throughout Africa, the baobab is associated with myths and legends. This is the tree that many African peoples believe to be the home of ancestral spirits. In the creation myth, in which every animal receives its own tree from the great spirit, it was originally given to the hyena, who threw the gift down in disgust. It landed the wrong way up, and so it became the upside-down tree, with its roots sticking up like branches. Rocks and stones are sometimes embedded in the trunks of these extraordinary trees as they rise out of the granite. The remains of an ancient stone wall curves along the rock on the southern side of Lekhubu Island. Archaeologists believe that it may have been associated with the people of Great Zimbabwe and used as an initiation centre where young men were brought for circumcision. Local people still use the island as a shrine, coming here to pray and leave offerings amongst the baobabs. Baobabs thrive in hot, dry, low-lying areas, like Zimbabwe's Gonorezo National Park. Many are found growing on the steep slopes beneath the Chilojo Cliffs, the seeds probably deposited there in baboon droppings. Elephants also eat the pods, and the seeds pass through their somewhat inefficient digestive tracts, ready to germinate in their dung. This is Namibia's northwestern boundary with Angola. It is where the Kuneni River plunges 35 meters over the Ipupu Falls on its way to the Skeleton Coast and the Atlantic Ocean. Clinging to bare rock amidst a torrent of water, the roots of some of these baobab trees are almost permanently submerged. The trees are thriving in seemingly impossible conditions, with no visible soil to sustain them. The 
the seeds must have been carried down on the current to lodge themselves in crevices, where they somehow germinated and thrived against extraordinary odds, drawing nutrients from the water. Away from the riverine strip of green vegetation, the surrounding countryside is hot and dry. The local Himba people are nomadic pastoralists dependent on their livestock. In this arid landscape, the baobab provides welcome shade. Further upstream at Ruakana, the Kanani River drops over a hundred meters into a 600 meter wide gorge forming another spectacular waterfall. Again, there are baobabs growing on the rocks between the torrents of falling water. As winter approaches, the trees begin to lose their leaves, returning once more to their more familiar leafless appearance. By now, fruit hangs thick on the branches of mature trees. The large seed pots can weigh up to two kilograms, and contain up to 400 seeds, all connected and fed by small fibers. A mature baobab can produce more than 250 fruit pods each year. The seed pods don't split open on their own. In winter, when their stems dry out, the pods fall to the ground. Some break open on rock or hard surfaces, but most are broken open by foraging animals or humans. Left on the ground, the pods are eventually eaten by termites or decay naturally, exposing the seeds for animals or birds to disperse. In ideal conditions, the seeds will germinate quite readily growing up to a meter in two years. But in the bush, very few become seedlings. Baobab seedlings and young trees are difficult to identify. They bear little resemblance to mature baobabs, which might explain why some tribes used to believe that the trees fell from the sky at night fully grown. Apart from a telltale bulb at the base, Saplings look like any other small tree. The leaves start out as single, simple structures, unlike the five-fingered leaves on adult trees. The saplings are vulnerable to grazing animals and even local people, who sometimes eat the tender roots of young seedlings. The main taproot looks a bit like a carrot, Young trees can look more like spindly shrubs than miniature baobab trees. Baobabs produce a wide web of roots, most of which are found near the surface. They spread wider than most trees to take up water from infrequent rainfall. The root network spreads out well beyond the branches above, sometimes extending to three times the width of its canopy. It is rare for a baobab to be toppled, but strong wind upended this tree, revealing most roots near the surface and no real taproot to anchor the tree. For much of the year, the tree is leafless. As the rains approach, new leaf buds appear at the tips of branches that have been barren for over six months. By early November, 
When the shrill hiss of cicadas emphasize the heat, flower buds form, and new leaves begin to cover the trees. When they are ready to open, the calyx, or capsule, that holds the unborn flower splits open, and in less than an hour, the white petals unfold to reveal a pearly white flower. Hundreds of stamens at the center of the flower hold out anthers covered in pollen. This powdery dust will be needed to fertilize the female stigma that sticks out below the stamens. All this takes place at night, when hawk moths are attracted to the sweet pungent scent of the flowers to drink nectar. The flower only lasts for about 18 hours, during which time it needs to be pollinated. Fruit bats are thought to be one of the main pollinators of the baobab, as they too flit from tree to tree, drinking the nectar at the base of the flowers. Only a few flowers open on any one tree each night, enticing the bats and moths to come back night after night. Being on the ends of branches and exuding a strong scent ensures that the bats find the flowers without having to rely on their poor eyesight. It's also a time when there are few flowers and very little other fruit available in the bush. Like everything else, the world's largest flowering plant seems to be waiting for the rains to come. Other insects, bees, ants and birds are attracted to flowers during the day before they wilt and fall. Tannin in fallen flowers causes them to quickly turn brown and their bitter taste discourages most animals from eating them. Baboons seem to like eating the flower casings before they open. The nectar at the base of the flower is sweet and makes this part of the flower taste good. Successful pollination results in the formation of a tiny pod that quickly grows to become the hard case that holds the pith-covered mature seeds. The soft wood is of little value as timber or firewood, but the trees are very important to indigenous people as a source of food, fiber and medicine. Leaves, fruit pulp and seeds are healthy foods and have a number of medicinal properties. Pith around the seeds is soaked and mixed with water or milk to make a nutritious, palatable drink, rich in calcium and vitamin C. The seeds, like the pulp, are also very nutritious. A coffee substitute can also be brewed from the seeds. Fluid from the boiled leaves is used to reduce fever and help treat malaria. The young leaves are cooked and eaten as a vegetable relish, not unlike spinach. 
ash from the wood can be used as a salt substitute, while the ash from pod husks can be used to make soap. The commercial exploitation of the baobab can provide opportunities for poor rural communities where the trees occur. The fruit is generally harvested by women and transported to processing plants where the fruit is broken open and the powder and seed removed and separated. The fruit of the baobab, largely found in the poorest regions of Africa, is now being hailed as an African superfruit because of its many attributes. Michel Adanson apparently recognized this fact when he concluded that of all the trees he had studied, the baobab is probably the most useful tree of all. Commercial baobab products include fruit pulp marketed as a natural cream of tartar and as a healthy additive to cereal bars and smoothies. Oil extracted from the seed is used in cosmetics, shampoo, conditioners, body lotions and soaps. In Senegal, bonsai baobabs are exported to Europe. The fibrous bark also has many uses. Early sailors found the strong fibers to be handy for making rope. People have utilized the bark for centuries. These scarred trunks show where the bark has been removed over the years without killing the tree. Today, people use the fibre to make baskets and mats for the tourist trade. Villagers strip panels of bark which are beaten to extract the fibres. These are then left to dry before being worked into a heavy thread that is woven into mats or ropes. Pigments are extracted from plants to dye the fibre. Pods are also displayed and sold to passing motorists. Because it is able to tolerate drought and changing weather conditions, it is also being hailed as a dryland crop for the future. In West Africa, young baobabs are cultivated for their roots, while the tender new leaves are sold in vegetable markets. They can be dried and stored for later use. Anticipating the change of season, leaves and flowers start to appear on the branches. The rains have not started yet, and food for birds and animals is scarce in the parched savannah. Parrots feed on the new bark. These mare's parrots, along with the brown and grey-headed parrots, are often found in the upper branches at this time of year. The grey-headed parrots use holes in the baobab for their nests. The mosque swallow and tiny spine tails also favour the baobab often nesting inside hollow trees. During the wet season, from about November to May, while the trees are in full leaf, the red-billed buffalo weavers set about rebuilding their communal nests. 
It's a cooperative effort, with several birds jointly building and defending the nests and feeding the young. Each nest has several chambers lined with grass and leaves where the birds roost at night. Each male defends a number of nest chambers, depending on his place in the pecking order. The weavers use thorny twigs for building. It discourages birds of prey and snakes. This baobab overlooks a floodplain where the Linyanti River forms the border between Botswana and Namibia. The rich grassland provides grazing for hundreds of cattle, as well as the herds of wild animals that will return when the water retreats. With inconsistent growth rings, it is difficult to determine the age and growth rate of the baobab. The largest, most magnificent specimens over 8 meters in diameter are reputed to be very ancient, possibly around 2,000 years old. But no one can be certain because old trees are often hollow. There is a tendency to overestimate the age of baobabs. A study published in 1963 using carbon dating calculated an age of just over a thousand years for a moderately sized tree. And recent sampling has confirmed ages of over 1,800 years for quite large trees. In 1858, David Livingstone wrote in his journal during his Zambezi expedition, Measuring at about 3 feet from the ground, I found the tree to be 72 feet in circumference. The same hollow tree, measured in 1965, was found to have increased in circumference by only two feet in 108 years. An often used general guideline is that one meter of circumference equals 100 years of age. The size of trees has more to do with good soil and a favorable climate with reliable rainfall than age alone. Many large baobabs are hollow. How this comes about is not clear. Some believe that the wood inside the tree has either rotted away or been damaged and removed by insects, animals or fire. Others reckon that the hollowness is the result of disease contracted early in the tree's life or the result of fungal decay. A more likely explanation is that this is a natural growth progression. A void develops within old trees while the outer section continues to grow. This was observed in areas where baobabs were cleared to make way for agricultural use. When hollow trees were cut down, the cavities were empty, with no evidence of fire damage or rot. The bark had the same smooth appearance on the inside as that found on the outside. New holes dug into big, solid-looking trees by elephants that turn out to be hollow reveal the same smooth chambers inside. Hollow chambers can be meters across and provide shelter for all sorts of creatures. Hollow trees provide a perfect home for several types of bat. The cool, dark recesses are safe and protected from the weather. Streaks of bird droppings indicate nest sites where owls and other birds have raised their chicks. In northern Kenya, hollow trees filled with water were used by slave and ivory raiders from Ethiopia to enable them to cross otherwise waterless country. A shallow trench dug around the tree would collect rainwater which was scooped up and stored inside the tree trunk. In southern Africa, the bushmen also used water stored in baobabs. In the Sudan, baobab trees are regarded as personal property that may be inherited or sold. Ownership is recorded in local government registers. Reservoirs in trees were often the only source of water available during the dry season for both villagers and long-distance travelers. 
In parts of West Africa, hollow baobabs have been used as burial chambers, a sort of living crypt. In South Africa, a functioning bar has been built inside a hollow tree, serving visitors who come to see the tree. Space between trees that have grown close together can also form large open chambers. It is rare to find young baobabs, like these, growing right next to each other. The hardy baobab endures all kinds of hardship, surviving fires, lightning strikes, drought, damage and disease. When the tree finally dies, the soft wood collapses into a soggy, fibrous pulp. Man has had a significant hand in extending the range of the tree by dispersing the seeds and initiating new populations. Pods are easy to carry and provide a useful source of food on long journeys. Clumps of baobabs sometimes indicate the presence of past human habitation. Some early explorers thought that the trees only existed where there had been villages or camps. It is said that old slave routes can be identified by the occurrence of baobabs. Pottery shards and grave sites near these baobabs at Chitaki mark the remnants of a village that once occupied this hilltop. It overlooked the Zambezi River floodplain near the present-day Mana Pools National Park in Zimbabwe. For centuries, the Zambezi provided a link to the east coast where Arab merchants came to trade for ivory and gold from the interior. Baobabs on the Mozambican coast marked the trading routes to the hinterland. Baobabs were first noted by 18th century explorers for their extraordinary size and girth and for their bizarre appearance, with what appears to be a tangle of roots sprouting from a bulbous trunk. In the mid-1800s, Victorian explorers, missionaries, hunters and traders travelled north from South Africa, passing through Botswana's Magadigadi Pans to avoid the deadly tsetse fly. The Green Brothers, hunters from Canada, carved the date of their expedition, 1858 to 1859, on a baobab tree. An inscription that is still clearly visible today. In 1852, elephant hunter James Chapman wrote about a vast baobab on the edge of a Kalahari salt pan, which became a beacon for travelers crossing this bleak landscape in their horse and ox drawn wagons. Apparently, 
Bushmen hunters would camp near this tree waiting for the expeditions and offer their services as guides and trackers for the journey north. This cavity served as a post box for travelers north and south. David Livingston, Thomas Baines and others camped beneath this tree. It measured 25 meters around its girth before it partially collapsed in January 2016. These trees were immortalized by Thomas Baines in a painting when he came across them in 1862 on his way to Victoria Falls. The artist and explorer painted watercolors of three different baobabs that year. He was fascinated by the fact that one of the trees continued to flourish in this prone position, sending out new shoots and branches, losing none of its vitality. The same trees are still visited today by travelers to Botswana's Magadi Gadi region. All the trees are still standing and flourishing as they did 150 years ago. The explorers measured and sketched the trees for a skeptical audience back home. Their hollow centers have served as prisons, toilets, wells and bars. They have been used as refuge in battle, as water systems and even as burial sites. David Livingston's wife Mary was buried beneath a giant baobab on the banks of the Zambezi River near Shupanga in Mozambique. She died from malaria, traveling with her husband on his Zambezi expedition. This enormous baobab in Namibia's Bushmanland is famous for the fact that the ill-fated Dorsland, or Thurstland trekkers, camped here on their way north in 1883 in search of political independence. They faced starvation and thirst on a grueling five-year journey to southern Angola, where they eventually settled. German soldiers, the Schutztruppe, later carved their names and the date, 1891, into the tree when Southwest Africa was a German territory prior to the First World War. The massive trunks have collapsed outward under their own weight, splitting the tree into several parts that continue to grow, sprouting new branches and leaves. This tree, known as Holboom or Hollow Tree, is another Namibian giant that has split under the weight of its branches, leaving a gaping hole at its center. A young giant eagle owl raised in this hollow tree uses his anthill perch to look out for prey. What appears at first to be a solid tree is completely hollow, providing a safe nesting place for this barn owl to hatch her eggs. White-backed vultures nest in large baobabs and tall acacias. They build a platform of sticks lined with dry grass, where they lay one egg between April and July.
This hollow tree has been used by a leopard to hide its kills from other predators. Bats roost in the folds and crevices. Bees frequently build their hives in the trunk's crevices. Honey has always been highly prized by rural communities, who go to great lengths to harvest it from high up in the branches. To get at the honey, local people hammer pegs into the trunk to form a ladder. These used to be made from sharpened hardwood stakes. In populated areas, it's not uncommon to see the holes left by these pegs. In this part of southern Africa, Shangan people used simple ladders made from poles wedged against the tree trunk. Many trees bear the scars left by the poles and by axes used to make hand and footholds to help the expert climbers reach the upper branches. Regarded by some as the largest succulent plant on earth, because of its ability to store water, the baobab is sometimes referred to as the tree of life. The very high water content helps keep them upright and hydraulic pressure helps maintain their shape. The trees shrink a little in the hot dry season when their water is depleted. The baobab is a natural provider. Wild animals eat parts of the tree when other food is scarce. In the dry season, elephants regularly dig away at the baobab trunks with their tusks to get at the soggy fiber. They chew the wood, extracting moisture and minerals before spitting out the fibers. The bark is rich in minerals which attract the elephants. Elephants gouging the bark sometimes break through into hollow trees. Somehow, they survive. Occasionally, the trees succumb and fall to the ground where other animals can reach the moist fibers. Bark on the lower parts of baobab trunks is often scarred from being stripped. Unlike other trees, the baobab can survive ring barking and continue growing in spite of the damage. Some fear that the baobab is at risk within national parks and wildlife reserves where large populations of elephants are confined. They undoubtedly strip the bark from trees for a brief time before the rains. But their impact is mainly found on flat ground close to game trails leading to water. There are very few new saplings or seedlings surviving in these areas. When a tree does break and fall, elephants gather for the feast.
A year later, this is all that remains. Of course, elephants also appreciate the shade provided by the baobab, when midday summer temperatures can rise above 40 degrees Celsius. To protect baobabs from elephants in the most visited areas of Gonorezor National Park, authorities have set large rocks around the base of trees that are under threat. Elephants and baobabs have survived together in the same areas for millennia and very few trees are destroyed. Over the past 20 years, it has been reported that large numbers of baobabs are dying from what appears to be a sooty mold fungus. It was first noticed near Victoria Falls in 1944. Affected trees look blackened as if they have been burned. The black mold is not what is killing the trees. It seems that what is now known as sooty bark disease may be caused by an opportunistic, stress-related pathogen that attacks when the tree is weakened by drought. This happens in overutilized areas where plant cover has been lost due to overgrazing, leading to sheet erosion and a loss of nutrients that weakens the tree. The sooty fungus then colonizes the tree weakened by the fungal pathogen, giving it the blackened appearance. Thankfully, there is some evidence that this happened earlier in the last century, and over time the trees recovered. Other diseases can take hold and quickly spread through a damaged tree, turning the wood black before it rots and falls. Parasitic plants and trees sometimes attach themselves to baobabs. Birds deposit seed-laden droppings in the fork of a tree, where they germinate and begin to grow. Strangler figs send down aerial roots, which eventually reach the ground, where they take hold and begin channeling water and nutrients to their leaves and branches. In time, the root becomes a trunk. Tree orchids and even mother-in-law's tongue sometimes take hold and use the baobab as host. Baobabs often support whole ecosystems within their bloated stems and branches. Their hollows and dents sometimes provide shelter to a variety of creatures. Bush babies, squirrels, rodents, lizards, snakes, tree frogs, spiders and insects may live out their whole lives within a single tree. Because the fruit is so prized by baboons and monkeys, the baobab is sometimes referred to as the monkey bread tree. 
This grove of baobabs in the Sambezi Valley is home to a large troop of chakma baboons. As darkness falls, the baboons climb into the high branches for safety. They sleep in the trees only coming down at sunrise. At first light, the baboons forage for remnants of fruit before moving off. The lack of seedlings and young trees found in the bush is often noted and is a reminder that recurrent fires, seed predation and perhaps competition from aggressive weeds are restricting regeneration of these extraordinary trees. Scrutiny of measured baobabs generally show large numbers of trees of certain sizes, with few in-between sizes, indicating what is known by botanists as episodic recruitment. In order for seeds to germinate and grow from seedlings into saplings big and strong enough to survive, they need ideal conditions to prevail for quite a long period of time. These episodes happen very rarely, perhaps just once in a hundred years. It could simply be several years of good rainfall or a few years without bushfires. Disruption to the normal cycle occasionally provides that critical, successful episode that favors the baobab. Because the tree is so long-lived, very few seeds need to germinate and grow into mature trees to maintain existing populations. Back in the 1800s, both David Livingston and Courtney Salou suggested that there might be two species of baobab. The Victorian explorers thought that trees with a pink coppery bark were not the same species as those with grey silvery bark. The explorer Richard Burton thought that there were inland and coastal varieties. The reason for these colour variations might simply depend on minerals in the soil. Variation in the shape and size of pods also lead people to believe that there are subspecies. Some pods are round, while others are elongated. Some trees produce a prolific amount of fruit every year, while others remain bare, leading some local tribes to believe that there are male and female trees. Whatever the botanical explanation, it is thought that the trees only started to flower at around 100 years of age, and the fruit increases in size and number as the tree grows bigger. Unfortunately, the fate of the baobab tree is linked to the fate of Africa's remaining wildlife and wilderness areas.
While still too numerous to be considered an endangered species, the baobab is threatened in some regions by large-scale clearing for agricultural development schemes. And in the drier regions, by desertification. An ever-growing human population is moving into once wild areas. Habitat for large animals and large trees is being lost forever. The high moisture content of the wood has spared the baobab from being used to make paper, charcoal, firewood or building material, which has, up until now, saved the tree. James Chapman, on seeing his first baobab, wrote, we were lost in amazement at the stupendous grandeur of this monarch of the forest. The tree is revered by many as the home of spirits, a tree with its own spirit. It is protected by law in South Africa and Botswana.